This morning we continue our series of messages we began last Sunday, the Ten Commandments for the 21st century. And we spent quite a bit of time last week talking about the Ten Commandments as a whole and the fact that they truly are for today. But we need to understand how they are for today. They are not the way in which we impress God. They are not the way we get into heaven. There are a lot of folks that think, well, if I live a good life, if I obey the Ten Commandments, then when my life is over, God's going to bring me into heaven. It doesn't work that way. And it didn't work that way back then either. We saw that some have this mistaken idea that in the Old Testament, people were saved by keeping the law, keeping God's commands. But now in the New Testament, we're saved by grace. No. In fact, in the Old Testament, they were saved by grace as well. We saw the sequence was very important. The fact that the Israelites had been redeemed out of Egypt by the blood of the Passover lamb. And then God gave them the Ten Commandments. Uh, You can think of it this way. God adopted them as his children and then said, now that you're my children, this is how I want you to act. And that's what God's commands are. It's once we are his children, he's telling us how we should behave. But our belief always precedes our behavior. And it's very important that we get that order correct. Now, last week we considered the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And we saw that God will not play second fiddle. And we come to the second commandment this morning, a message that I'm calling idle threats. But you'll notice idle is spelled I-D-O-L. That is not a typographical error, that is intentional. Um, Because in the second commandment, God specifically forbids there to be idols. There's not to be idols that we worship. Now in his book, Gods at War, Kyle Eidelman records a conversation he had with his eight-year-old daughter, Morgan. He says, I was sitting on her bed for nightly prayers, but she had a surprise for me before we prayed. She had been doing some memory work and she wanted to recite it for me. Dad, she said, do you want me to, do you want to hear me say the Ten Commandments? You memorized them all? Yeah. Okay. So, said, I lay down next to her and listened to Morgan as she worked her way through the greatest top ten list of them all. The one that came in tablet form and was recorded in Exodus 20. She made her way through them in kind of a sing-song voice. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. On down the list. Now as she finished, my teachable moment kicked in. And I said, Morgan, that was great. Let me ask you, have you ever broken any of those commandments? She smiled again. This time it wasn't as much a shy smile as a guilty one. Kind of the smile I give my wife when she asked what happened to all the Sour Patch watermelons that were meant for the kids' lunchboxes. I could see that Morgan was trying to think through an answer that would be honest without indicting her. I decided to help. Well, let's see. Have you ever lied? She nodded slowly. Have you ever wanted something so much that you wish they didn't have it? She nodded, discovering she was guilty of coveting. I kept pushing. Now, I know you've never murdered anybody, Morgan, but have you ever really, really been angry at somebody so much that maybe you hated them? Morgan, have you ever maybe, I don't know, uh, not honored your father and mother? We both knew the answer to that one. Now, this was not going the way she had planned. Uh, That's how it goes when you're stuck with a preacher for a daddy. She let out a heavy sigh, which I immediately recognized. It's the same sigh I get on Sunday morning when someone's losing interest in the sermon. It's time to stop preaching and offer the invitation. But before I had a chance, her eyes brightened. And she said, Dad, I know one commandment that I've never broken. I've never made an idol. 
Now, I really, really wanted to respond to that. I wanted to tell my daughter that, as a matter of fact, that particular commandment is the one we all break most often. This morning, we are going to look at that second commandment. It's found in Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. God says, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the sin of the, for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, this might sound really similar to the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. In fact, in some Lutheran and Catholic circles, uh, they list the commandments by combining these two. But you've got to have ten, so they split the tenth commandment. Uh, they split, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Uh, that's kind of forced. And in fact, these are two separate things. They are related. I'll admit that. They're close, but they're not the same thing. I agree with G. Campbell Morgan. The second commandment is by no means a repetition of the first. It forbids the creation of anything that is supposed to be a representation of God to assist our worship in, of Him. When we examine the first commandment, we face the awesome glory of the nature of the one true God. The second commandment deals with a vital and related issue, not so much what God is, but what God is not. And anything that we try to fashion that will help us worship God, we're going to see never quite makes it. It never quite... Uh, contains all that God is. There are 14 different Hebrew words for idols in the Old Testament. Now, most of them are the what we think of. Statues or images uh, such as, you know, Baal, um, Asherah, uh, Chemosh, and, and Molech, some of the, the, these idols that other... Uh, the other nations made. We're going to take a look at those in a little bit. Uh, but there's another word for idol. And it can apply to any real or imagined picture of a deity in our minds. Now, some have thought that this means you should not have any artistic uh, creations. You shouldn't paint pictures or, or do carving or anything like that. I don't think that's what God's talking about here. He's speaking specifically of objects of worship. These are things that we give value to. We place worth on them more than they deserve. And they become, in fact, something we worship. That's what God is getting at here. Now, why does God insist that no such images be made? Because every attempt to represent God in some visible, tangible way results in a false picture of God. However we try to portray Almighty God, it comes up inadequate and inferior to who He really is. Whatever we concoct to represent God is limiting. And God is limitless. Now we may capture one facet of God but we're going to miss everything else. So we have to be very careful that we don't create, whether it's an actual image or even in our mind, something of God that is less than who He is. We've got to be careful. Not only does God command us to worship the correct deity, that's what commandment one is all about, he also expects us to worship Him correctly. And Jesus said in the Gospel of John, God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. 
And I believe he was speaking right to what this second commandment is all about. Now this morning I'd like to consider three types of idols that are forbidden or prohibited by the second commandment. The first I am calling secular idols. This is what we typically think of when we think of an idol. All right, this is a statue, this is an image, or it could even be something in nature that people would worship, they would make sacrifices to, they would try to appease in some way. In the Old Testament, we read of Baal. Baal was the god of fire, uh, typified by lightning. Asherah, Asherah was a goddess of fertility. Uh, the gods Chemosh and Molech were the gods of the Ammonites and the Moabites. And uh, the, the god Molech in particular uh, was made out of metal. And it was hollow. In fact, there was an opening in the beginning. But the god had his hands out. And in the worship of Molech, they would build a fire inside the idol. And it would get that metal glowing hot. And then in the worst manifestation of all, they would take a child and place it into the hands of this, this glowing hot God, sacrificing children. And God was very clear to the Israelites, you were never to do that. That is absolutely detestable in my sight. So these are the kinds of idols that were all around the Israelites at the time God made this commandment. Don't be like them. Don't do this. Other cultures would worship the sun or maybe the moon. Uh, perhaps there's a, a great big tree that's bigger than all the others and has been there for a long time. And, and they, that's their God and they worship it. Some worship a river. Or a rock. These are tangible objects that, that people latch on to and say, This is my God. This is who I have to uh, please and serve, and they're going to protect me and give me what I want. <laughs> now you say, uh, that's, That seems very silly. Why would anybody worship a tree or a rock? Why would anybody worship something they made with their own hands, like a statue or an image? And what you find out is the purpose in making an image was to try to enlist that God in order to bless them and protect them. You see, it wasn't so much to serve them as it was to control. Something you make, you can control. You can set the rules. You can decide what's right and what's wrong. And you'll find that doesn't work with God. God cannot be manipulated. Now, we probably have all tried it at one time or another, right? You know, there's, there's something coming up, maybe it's in school and there's a big test, and we, may, we try to make a deal with God. God, I'm going to be really good if you'll help me get through this test. Or, or maybe, maybe a little later in life we're, we're undergoing a different kind of test. Maybe it's a medical test. We're kind of worried. God, I'll pray to you every day and I'll go to church on Sunday and I might even give money in the offering if you'll let this test come out okay, right? We, we try to bargain with God. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't even respond to reverse psychology. You know, we don't even admit it, but you know, kind of behind the scenes we're like, well, if I do that, God's going to do this. God can't be manipulated. He can't be controlled. But that's what they were doing with these idols. You say, well, we don't really have to worry about those kind of idols today, do we? Uh, but there are some cultures out there we know that worship these things. But, you know, we're sophisticated. Here in America, we don't bow down to a, a statue or a rock or the sun. Eh, not so fast. How many of you know what was celebrated over this last weekend? Earth Day. No, that's not necessarily bad in itself. What you hear a lot of was around Earth Day, Mother Nature. And there is actually in our country, in our culture, a worship of Mother Nature. 
people worship the earth and say, this is where we came from and this is what we must do to take care of it. Now, we should take care of the earth, but we shouldn't worship it. It should never become our God. The Puritans, they included superstition as a violation of the second commandment. I think they may have had something there. They taught that all who trust in anything other than God are idolaters. Whether it's a rabbit's foot, tea leaves, a crystal ball, crossing your fingers, refusing to walk under a ladder, a lot of superstition gets involved in this. To give credence to astrology, even reading a horoscope. Uh, now, people that will read palms or tarot cards or Ouija boards, all these things, they're forbidden by God. In fact, if you have time on your own, you'd like to look it up, Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 13, it's worth a read. God strictly forbids these things. Why? Because we are putting our trust in something other than Him. We're trying to figure out the future instead of leaving it in His hands and living by faith. Now understand, most of the things I've mentioned here, especially those items of nature, there's nothing wrong with them. They're good in and of themselves. Often the most dangerous idols are good things that have been twisted. In fact, the very best things can make the most tempting idols, as we're going to see in a moment. Now the second category I'd like to consider is sacred idols. These are things that usually are associated with the worship of the true God, but can take on almost a life of their own and a significance far more than they were intended to. Uh, Let me give you a couple examples from the scripture. Numbers chapter 21 tells a story of the wilderness wanderings. This is after the Ten Commandments have been given. And the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness. Beginning in verse 4, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread. There's no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many of Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. I want to say, you think? (laughs) Pray to the Lord that they'll take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now, notice this. God doesn't take the snakes away. He does something else. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. All right, here's a scary story with a happy ending. God provided a a remedy. He didn't take the snakes away, but he did say, if you look at this snake, you'll be healed, even if you're bitten. Uh, Have you ever wondered, what's the deal there? I mean, why didn't God just make the snakes go away? Because looking at that snake was a a step of faith. Because if you're looking up at the snake, what are you not looking at? The snake's on the ground. So you had to trust in what God said that looking at that snake, there wasn't anything magical about that snake, but it was the step of faith that God honored that provided healing. But there became a problem. In 2 Kings 18, we read that Hezekiah, when he became king, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places. This was places that people worshipped other gods. He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. Why? Why? For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. In fact, they had given it a name, Nehushtan. Now, Nehushtan is Hebrew for bronze snake. Well, who would have guessed that? 
right? <clears throat> but by giving it a name, they personified it. They made it more than it was. And rather than being a memory of a way God had worked years ago, it became their God. They started worshiping it until a godly king came and had to destroy it because it was taking the place of God in people's lives. Things that God has used mightily in the past sometimes become idols. They're sometimes called relics, and we get very superstitious about them. You know, none of us are looking for bronze snakes for protection, right? Anybody that knows me knows there's no way you get a bronze snake in my house. I don't want to see them on television, let alone in real life. But you know, there are some sacred idols that, that we may have today. Uh, it, it, it might be a particular Bible. Maybe that Bible was one of your parents or a grandparent. And there's a lot of sentimental value attached to that. Now that's not wrong, okay? There's nothing wrong with being sentimental, because, <laughs> boy, I'd be in trouble if there was. But if we attach too much importance to that object, this Bible is going to protect me. No, it's not. That Bible is paper with ink printed on it. Now, yes, there's some memories attached and some sentiment attached to it, but don't treat it like some kind of a lucky charm. Uh, it might be, it might be a, a, a cross you know, some people wear a cross around their neck. That's not bad. Uh, a while back, there was a, a time where it was real popular to have these crosses that fit in the palm of your hand. And people would carry them. And maybe if they were undergoing a stressful time, they'd kind of reach in and take hold of that cross. And, and it gave them some peace. There's nothing wrong with that, again, unless we attach the significance to the object. Instead of what the object represents. It's really no different than a, a lucky rabbit's foot or, or something else we attach superstition to. It's just a religious item. And that falls into the same category. Don't let a thing take the place of God. Don't put your faith in this object and you're carrying it or you're taking care of it. That is not what's going to save you. That's not what's going to help you. We have a tendency sometimes to focus on the gifts and we forget about the giver. We do this with our leaders. Be very careful that you're not following an individual, including this one, more than you follow the Lord. Because all leaders are human and they are going to stumble and fall and if you're following them too closely, you're going to trip over them. Paul said, follow after me as I follow after Christ. Remember, we are following Christ. And we honor Christ and we worship Christ. You don't worship me. Don't get too attached to this building. Or to certain objects in this building. Yes, they might have a sentimental value to you and that's okay. But don't let it go too far. That's what the second commandment is all about. The bronze serpent had served its purpose in its time, but the Israelites had turned it into a shrine. What was meant to be a reminder of God became a God. we got to be careful that we don't do the same thing. Another example is the golden calf. This was actually created while Moses is getting the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 32, it talks about how the people came to Aaron and they said, uh, we don't know about Moses. You know, he's been up there so long, and that's kind of scary up there. Why don't you make us something we can worship? So Aaron said, well, bring me some gold, you know, your earrings and jewelry, and, and uh, we'll, we'll fashion something here. It's kind of funny. Later on, when Moses confronted him and said, what are you doing? Aaron said, you won't believe it. People brought all their gold and jewelry, and up popped this golden calf. <laughs> I tried that story like that sometime with my parents. It never worked. <clears throat> but here they are. They, they fashion a calf. Now, here's the part I don't know that I'd ever seen before. After Aaron creates this golden calf, 
And he says, These are the gods, O Israel, that brought you out of Egypt. Notice the next verse. Exodus 32. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and said, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Did you ever catch that before? Aaron wasn't saying, here's a different God. He's saying, this is Almighty God. We're going to worship Yahweh, the Lord God, by worshiping this calf. He really thought that he was doing the right thing. He really thought he was bringing the people's attention to the Lord God by introducing an idol that never works. (laughs) It never works. The people were afraid of the Lord whom they could not see, so they wanted Aaron to make a God they could see. It wasn't so much a violation of the first commandment because Aaron was still drawing their attention to the Lord God, but it was a violation of the second. Don't make any image and bow down and worship to it. And this is not an Old Testament phenomenon either. D.L. Moody writes, The apostles were hardly in their graves before people started putting up images of them and to worship relics. People have a desire for something tangible, something they can see. And that's true. We do have this tendency. We want something we can see, that we can touch. Because it's hard to believe in a God that you can't see. But that is what we are called to do. We we need to be very careful today that we allow anything, a cross, a Bible, a church building, a relic, to become an object of superstitious adoration. When we do so, we're confusing the symbol with reality. Now the third classification is what I'm calling spiritual idols. Idolatry can not only be something physical and tangible it can be something immaterial and spiritual and you don't have to go to heathen lands to find false gods america is full of them whatever you make most of is your god whatever you love more than god is your idol you can make an idol of a spouse a child a relationship. You can make a God of pleasure. You can make a God of fashion. You can make a God of money. You don't have to literally bow down to have a spiritual idol. They don't have to be figures made of stone or precious metal. They don't even have to be things you can touch or hold at all. I think some of the most powerful idols exist only in the mind. Our human understanding is like a workshop where idols are continually being crafted. Idolatry has always been around and it always will be. The only thing that changes is the nature of the idols. An idol is anything that you put in place of God in your life. And it can be your career. It can be possessions. It can be sports. Oh boy, that's getting close to home. It can be relationships. An idol is what you live for. An idol is what fills your mind when you lie awake at night. An idol is what we buy magazines about. It's what we spend our time, our money, and our energy on. Idolatry occurs when we hold anything higher than God. You see, idolatry isn't just one of many sins. Idolatry is the one great sin that all the other ones come from. If you start scratching at the surface of what you're really struggling, you're going to find that underneath it's a false god. And until that god is dethroned in your life, and the Lord God takes his rightful place, you will not have victory. The deadliest war is the one most of us never realize is being fought. Most of us are like that eight-year-old girl at the beginning of my message. Oh, I've never broken that commandment. (laughs) That's a commandment we all break more often than we'd like to think. What if it's not about statues? What if it's 
not about gods with funny names and, and weird shapes. What if we do our kneeling and our bowing with our imagination, our checkbooks, our search engines, and our calendars? What if I told you that every sin you're struggling with, every discouragement you're dealing with, even the lack of purpose you're living with is because of idolatry. We've put something ahead of God. So what's the answer? Get rid of everything and go live in a monastery? No, that's not the answer. Throw away all our Bibles and crosses and pictures of Jesus? Toss away anything that reminds us of anything? No, we don't have to go that far. I believe the answer is found in the final verse of John's first letter. 1 John 5.21 says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Certainly, that's exactly the second commandment's all about. I really like how the New Living Translation renders that same verse. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. That is idolatry. Anything. It can be a good thing. It can be a God-given thing. But anything that comes before God, anything that we hold on to that is not God becomes our God and we are guilty of idolatry. This is very much an issue for the 21st century. We still are tempted with the sin of idolatry to just the idols look a little differently than they did back then. And really the only way to defeat the temptation of idolatry is to put God where he belongs. Put God first. Make him your priority. Don't give him what's left over of your time, of your energy, of your possessions. You give God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and then everything else will be added to you. The rest of your life will fall into place. That doesn't mean it's always going to be great. We still live in a world that is cursed by sin and we still deal with disappointments and struggles and, and, and even death. But when we put God in His rightful place, He will help us get through whatever life throws at us. Knowing that when this life is over, we'll spend eternity with him. Will you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we have been challenged today again through your word and through your spirit. I pray in these quiet moments, your spirit would speak to each of us individually and, and show us things in our lives that perhaps have taken on more significance and meaning than they should. Things that we think we need in order to worship you, when in fact all we need to worship you is our mind and our heart. Things that have taken your place in our lives, that have become more important than you, whether it's an actual object that we can see and feel, or maybe it's something intangible like a relationship or our career. Whatever it is, I pray that you would convict us. I pray that we would confess whatever idols we've been holding on to. As we sang earlier, break down every idol, cast out every foe. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. We thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. And the opportunity every day, to start anew with you. Speak to us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.